So we left off, we started talking about what is order. Now, we discussed that order is not what people typically think. Order, when you start talking about order, it's like, oh, I'm going to organize my closet. I'm going to hire, what's that Japanese lady? She comes and she organizes, right? <laughs> she comes to, uh, to uh, organize your closet that and fold your laundry a, a new way. No, that's not, that's not the idea. The idea here of order is getting life's priorities in their place. What is our priority in life? And we discussed last time that imagine someone were to live through life and not realize what their purpose in life was and travel all of that distance of life without ever focusing on what was truly important. And that's the purpose of order. The purpose of order is to really identify what is my purpose in this world. I have something unique that I can bring to this world. I have something special that I can offer, uh, that I can bring light into this world, what is it? Now, what I've done in the past is that I've given an assignment that everyone should write their own personal life's mission statement. Now, businesses do this. Businesses, they, get, they, get, they hire an expensive uh, uh, a advisor, and they go through what is the purpose of your business. You know, it's like uh, Krispy Kreme is th their, their mission is to make people smile one donut at a time, okay? At coffee, uh, Starbucks, they have a similar mission, is to make people happy and to enrich their day with a delightful coffee. Great. What is your mission? What is our mission? Each as an individual, we need to have a mission statement that we can focus our life on, that every day we wake up and we say, you know what, this is my mission, this is my goal, this is what I want to accomplish today. Yes. No, not at all. It, it, it should be something that is challenging, not too challenging, elevating, and something which can bring us closer to our purpose. Well, if exercising is important to you, great, so exercise. But I don't know that that would be a mission unless someone is really challenged with the lack of exercise, and therefore exercise would be a step in that. But there we all know that there are long-term goals every business, has a long-term goal and short-term goals. It's very important to identify the difference between them, right? Uh, the long-term goal is to, is to do a lot of business. Well, what's the short-term goal? To do a lot of business. That doesn't work. You've got to crystallize the idea. What is it that you want to accomplish? Okay? And now, okay, so, so we, we spoke about the structure of the world. The world is structured in a way God created the world impeccable perfection. Absolute perfection. The sun rises at the exact time and it sets at the exact time. Imagine one morning, uh, anybody here an early riser? I'm not, so I'll put my hand down. Right? But uh, whoever's an early riser, you know exactly what time you can ask Google, you can ask uh, a Siri or whoever else, what time is sunrise tomorrow morning and they will tell you at the exact millisecond what time sunrise will be. Imagine sunrise time should it's coming and it's still dark outside. And then, you know, at 9 o'clock, finally the sun rises. Th the whole world would be in chaos, right? So you ask the sun, what happened? He said, you know, I had a little coffee break, <laughs> took a little time off, and now, you know, I just uh, I decided, I'm sorry I'm late, you know. Th there would be absolute chaos in the world. The entire productivity of the world would change if one millisecond was off with our, within our world. It is remarkable. So our sages define seder. You know how many things have to do with order? Seder is order. Okay, so we have our Pesach seder. We also have another incredible thing called a sitter. Same word. S a sitter is our prayer book. It's also in order. Right? We have um, the Mishnah, which is called Shisha Sdarim, which is the six orders. All of holiness is based on order. Pesach, which is the time where we elevate ourselves from the lowest level to the highest level, we need order. That's why our Seder, our Pesach Seder, is called a Seder. Because you, in order for a person to grow, we need to have an order. Okay. So. That's catching us up from last week. And we discussed how 
typical weekdays are easier to structure and organize and order uh, while order during downtime, holidays, vacations, uh, Shabbat, weekends, is more difficult for us to have structure. But those are the days that are considered holy days. right? The holier the day, the more order is required. Let's, let's take this slowly. Of course, there are always exceptions and situations that we haven't an anticipated. You know, I, I've shared the story before, I believe in this class, about my son who was a preemie, and my wife was in the, uh, my, my the baby was in the NICU, and uh, our whole life turned over. For several months, everything was, was chaos. But I remember making a commitment at that time to my wife and to my family that our order of life won't change. Circumstances are, are different. They change all the time. But we need to make sure that the kids are on time on school and they're picked up on time from school. So that's one structure. Now, I also have classes that we we're giving. We're giving in all different places. I said we're not canceling anything. We need to make sure that we have a structure and an order, even when things are in chaos. Right? And emergencies always come up. Emergencies come up. Urgent situations. The that has the potential of removing order in our life. It now, why is it important to have our mission statement? If we have our mission statement, even when we have chaos, we maintain a focus. Understand? I, it's so critical. If we're able to know what we're here for, to do acts of kindness. Okay, so your your schedule is a little off. Okay, but you can still do acts of kindness. Okay? It, it's, it's critically important. If order is truly instituted in our regular areas of life, we will also succeed in other areas. Okay? So the more we're able to structure our life, our days, with order, with focus, the more we will be able to succeed in all areas of life. A person who does not put the proper order when odd situations arise can lose so much. So my little daughter is Hadassah. She is uh, now two years old. And if I were to take her up a staircase, uh, you know, a big staircase, it would be difficult for her to pick up her, her, her leg all the way up to take the next steps. So I'd have to either to carry her up or assist in a way, right? My, my grandmother, may she live and be well, is in her 90s, deep in her 90s. For her, it would be also very difficult for her to climb up the steps. My son is a 17-year-old teenager. One step is not enough. He'll take like four steps at a time, you know, jumping up, right? Steps is very discriminatory because it's one size fits all. No, it's one size fits whoever it fits. But if you take a ramp, everybody can take their own size step. For one person, they can take a bigger step. For one person, they can take a smaller step. Every person takes their own size step. That is the secret of why in the temple there was a ramp. Because every time you look at the temple, you'd see this ramp. And what God is telling you, there's no pre-engineered growth in Judaism. You don't have to be like your neighbor, and you don't have to be like your friend, and you don't have to be like anyone else. Be yourself. Take your own size step. There's a ramp there for a reason. Take the step that's right for you. No one is going to tell you what is the right step for you. Oh, you have to take this step. Because, you know, a, a, a staircase is pre-engineered. It's six and a half inches, and that's it. You know, by the way, they did a very interesting study, how the brain works. Do you know that in the subway system in New York, the steps are very steep, right? They're going underground. And what they did was is they added a half an inch to one of the steps. A half an inch, that's it. And people, every person who walked up the step fell. They tripped because their brain is, okay, they take the first step, it's, it's, it's six and a half inches, six and a half inches, six and a half, and the brain knows exactly how high the, s the foot needs to go to get to the next step. And then it's suddenly seven inches, they fall. And they trip because they have that momentum and, and, and it would be off. I say that that's the risk of trying to take a step we're not ready for. 
If I try to grow like my neighbor, hey, my neighbor started giving charity like this, I should do the same. My neighbor started going to synagogue like this, I should do the same. My neighbor started volunteering, I should do the same. Guess what? You may not be ready for that. They may, that may not be your step. And you can trip and fall. We have to be so careful in Judaism that there's no pre-engineered growth. There's no such thing as someone dictating for you, this is what you need to do, this is what you have to do. We all are on a journey. Everybody has a different point A and everybody has a different point Z. And all of the challenges that we're going to go through, there's no one here in the room, even if you have a twin sister sitting next to you or a twin brother, who is the same. We all have different faces. We all have different fingerprints. We all have different DNA. We all grew up in different homes and we all have different challenges. That's life. That's the way life should be. God doesn't want us. That's one of the reasons some, some of the sages comment on why a brother is not allowed to marry a sister. Because God wants new creations. He doesn't want the same thing. There wouldn't be any newness. You want a total stranger boy, total stranger girl, let them fall in love and let them create a new life together, a new world together. You understand? There would be a, a new existence and that new existence is a whole new world, a whole new dimension. Even, you know, it's funny because many, many children carry their traits of their parents. They have a father who has uh, a bad temper, God forbid, right? So <laughs> the child sometimes can adopt that bad temper. But there are some of the ingredients from the mother that can be put into that child. We see this with Abraham and Isaac we see and, and Ishmael. We see this with um, and Sarah. We see this with Isaac, Rebecca, and Jacob, and Esau. We see that they, they had a combination of the different qualities. Each one was uniquely different. It, it's a really, it really is incredible. Every person has their own set of challenges. Yes? Okay, so let me, let me address both of those. Uh, judging. So we discussed how dangerous it is to judge other people. Because the, th the Mishnah says a very incredible idea. It says, never judge someone till you're standing in their place. Now, what is the likelihood that you'll ever be standing in someone's place? Never. Because you ha in order to be standing in that place, you have to have the entire history that brought them to that place and the entire future that follows that place. So it's unlikely. So basically what the Mishnah is telling us don't judge other people. You can't judge them. But the Mishnah doesn't say that. In another place it says, judge people favorably. And if you're already judging, which we do, because you know we have two sides of our brain, right? We're like, if they're like the scales, we're always judging. We're always judging. And what the Mishnah is trying to train us and teach us is that if you're already judging, learn to judge favorably. And don't ever think it's really, it's really an incredible, remarkable thing. People think that what you see is what you get. And it's never the case. It's never the case. Was there ever anyone here, okay, you don't have to be embarrassed if you tell me, that was driving really fast because they were running to an appointment, to a meeting, something came up, right? Anybody? Yeah. It happened to all of us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Lenny, it happened to you once, once or twice? Right? You're rushing someplace, right? But how many times do we see someone else driving crazy and we're like, huh, look at this idiot. Can't they learn how to drive? Right? Can't this, what's wrong with them? Right? But when it happens to us, what do we say? I'm sure they understand that I'm just rushing and that's not really the way I am. We're justifying in our mind that everyone understands. When you see someone else, it's very easy, right? <laughs> so the, the, there's I it's very important to realize that I every single human being on planet Earth is unique. There are no two people who are the same. Yes, do we have a lot that we can empathize with other people, we can feel some of their challenges, we can understand some of the, the what you're going through, but can we say that we experience the exact same thing? It could be that we had a similar experience, but the background or the backbone that we have to be able to handle it could be very different. One person could fall apart from an experience 
Another person can be like, okay, just let's just move on. Right? Well, we all have different backgrounds. We all have different parents who have given us different strengths, different communities, different teachers, and so on and so forth. So that is, that is I think, the most incredible uh, lesson to learn from the temple is that everyone has to take their own unique size step. And your own personal mission statement shouldn't just be to do good things, to be nice to my fellow man. Right? That's, that's not enough. Right? We have to get into the details. Knowing myself, knowing my strengths and weaknesses, what is God's mission for me? So let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a, a, uh, an, a, an analogy. I, I had a, a Scotty. Scotty just made Aliyah, Bobby's son. You just made Aliyah. And I told him, I want you to know something. I said, you're going to go to Israel, and you're going with all these um, rose, rose-colored lenses. You're expecting for it to be so special and so incredible for you to be in Israel until you have your first interaction with the real Israeli. <laughs> and, and then you're like, why can't people just be nice? <laughs> right? Why, why do they have to be so aggressive? Why do they have to be so impatient? What is going on here? Why, why are they honking their horn constantly? Why are they yelling and screaming at each other? What is going on here? It's craziness. Let me go back to Houston where people are calm and people are relaxed. And so, I said, so I said, let me explain something to you, okay? I said, have you ever woken up in the morning and realized that your neighbor has his AK-47 aimed at your doorstep? No. Anybody here wo- slept like that? Every, anybody woke up like that? W- you know, y- you see your neighbor a- aiming his his AR-15 at you. No. Did anybody wake up once in the morning and see that all of the neighboring counties have rockets facing your doorstep? No. But guess what? In Israel, that's a reality every single day. You think you're not going to be a little mashuga, right? Just a little, <laughs> right? Just a little, a little tense. Right, and this morning, I don't know if you saw in the news that there were rockets being, uh, being, being, sh- yes, towards towards Ashkelon, towards Sderot. Sh- I mean, this is a crazy reality that children grow up in, and we're coming there as visitors from the United States, and we're like, hey, why aren't people more relaxed? <laughs> you know, it's like, like that's the reality of living in Israel, right? Now, again, we have to realize that there is a very different world that is, I- is different, by the way, from state to state. You look at this, one of the fascinating things that you see in this election cycle that we're going through, you see it every time, is that what the issues that you have in New York are very different than the issues you have in Detroit. And the, dis- the issues that you have in Detroit are very different than the issues you have in Kansas or in Texas or in California or in Wyoming, right? So you have very, very different realities in different places. While we want to say, yes, we're all human beings, we all have basic needs, we need to eat, we need to drink, right? We all want to have a connection with other human beings, we, we, stri- we, we desire happiness, that's true. In almost every culture, that's, that's true. But the way in which we get there is very different. The journey is a different journey. The challenges that we face are different challenges, right? I'll give you an example. There are people here in Houston, Texas, who can complain you know something, it's so difficult, you know, the, 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 uh, the having a job and going through traffic to your work and you have all of these challenges and you have someone else from New Zealand or from someplace else look at you and say, are you crazy? This is a piece of cake, right? This is nothing compared to what I have to go through, right, in my country, right? So, yes, while life is an experience that could be identified with similar experiences around the world, it's very different. I don't know if you've ever been to Moscow. It's not the same. Okay, I've been to Moscow. You go, you go to you go to uh, Lukashenko's uh, Minsk. I was there. It's communist. It's communist. It's uh, it's unbelievable poverty. It's unbelievable poverty. And then I went with a couple of friends. We went to the bowling alley. And you saw Bentleys and Rolls Royce and you know Mercedes and every that's you know you have you don't have a middle class in 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 in, in Belarus you have the super duper upper class and then you have people who are starving that's it those are the two the two uh, you know the two the, the so y- I- there are different different places different challenges that every single individual faces 
Everything is about balance in Judaism. I, it's, you know, it's very good to be kind, but if you're too kind, you're going to starve to death, right? It, it's very good to be healthy, but if you're always exercising, right, there are other challenges that come with it. I mean, you understand? A person has to have a balance in their life. And that I would think that that's the answer that, that appropriately answers uh, to your question of, yes, it's true. We need to help other people, and we need to do whatever we can. Right? You know, I, I was talking to a group of uh, high school students um, back when the whole, uh, with the earthquake that happened in Haiti, right? So I said to the students, I said, this was in, I, if I remember correctly, this is in HSPVA. Uh, we had a group there that we were, we were uh, running for the high school students there. So I said, what can we do here? Here we are sitting in Houston, Texas. We weren't affected at all, right? We can go to uh, Walgreens and donate $10 to the American Red Cross, and then they'll probably squander it with some right fraudulent, uh, uh, you know, okay. Wh what are we going to do? What can we do for them? There's really nothing we can do. Except we can think about them, we can pray for them. And I'm not just saying, like, you know, people today tweet when something happens, you're in our, our thoughts and prayers. Uh, that, that, not thoughts and prayers. Like, really put it into your, your, into, into your consciousness. Feeling someone, imagine the feeling of not having a home anymore. Imagine a feeling of when it rains, you don't have a roof over your head. Right? That would be a terrible experience. Think about that for a second. Feel their pain. That is a way of connecting with those people. Right? Can I actually do something? Maybe I can give $10 uh, if it'll ever get to them. Fine. Great. So that's one step. And that's an easy one. I, f I feel that that's very, it's very disingenuous. I, I believe it, it because it's sort of, you know what? They ask you, do you want to add $10 for the Haiti Fund? And you're like, I can't be so, you know disconnected and so so it's like let me let me quiet down my conscience here i'll give ten dollars and now i'm done okay i'm I'm done i did my i did my share right and that's it and I, I i quieted my conscience and i move on the israelis were amazing zaka was incredible and a hundred percent a hundred percent and that's why we have to s seek out worthy causes you know my 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 sister and brother-in-law lost a child and they wanted to do something special because they felt that the first responders were really so incredible. You know, they came to, it was, it was I don't know what you call, you call it, it's just a sudden death, right? And uh, th their child was perfectly healthy, eight months old, and um, really, really tragic. So they decided they wanted to do something in his memory. So they, they embarked on a mission to buy a new vehicle for Zaka. Right, and it really was, it was very, very special, and they and they they did that. But Zaka is the first responders in all terrorist uh, attacks. They, you know, the one with the with the light uh, green vests, the yellow gr yeah, green vests. You see them picking up, uh, you know, the the remains of, of 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 the. And it's really it's not it's not a glamorous job. It's not, but it's really people who are dedicated, and so it's like they work with uh, with the United Hatzalah uh, first responders. It really is an incredible team of people. People are dedicated to doing selfless acts, right? No one wants to go to, to pick up, you know, pieces of, uh, uh, of a disaster. And they do it lovingly, caringly, responsibly, and uh, ethically. So it really is a, a special, special organization. They're the first responders, by the way. They went to Mexico. They went to all of these terrible tragedies that happened. They're the first team that goes out. They're always ready to go. And w I brought an example from Moses. What did Moses do for the Jewish people? You know, you know why he was chosen? It says Moses went out and saw their pain. He felt their pain. He felt their pain. That's the number one qualification for leadership. All right? After you feel their pain, you'll figure out what to do already. But if you don't feel their pain, if you don't really feel it in your bones, what their pain is, what their, what their plight is, it's very difficult to actually do something. Correct. So that was the first step of leadership I was trying to, to, to impart to them. A person who does not put order when odd situations arise can lose so much, right? We need to ensure not to waste too much time and to do and we do our ordinary tasks with as much structure and order as possible. Almost daily we have situations that are unexpected 
and can be exceptions, okay? So we all have a, a daily schedule. We all have the time we want to wake up, the time we eat breakfast, hopefully, and et cetera, et cetera. From there, our day begins. Um, but things happen. Someone calls, it's an emergency, you have a meeting, you're going to be late for the meeting, things like that. And every day is its own challenge. And I told you that I myself, I've shared this, I, I am one of those who are called uh, punctually challenged, right? And, and, um, and I try to work on it by trying to, A, identify that I have this, okay? And B, take a step in ensuring every day that my day becomes more and more uh, on time and effective. Okay. Um, two important spiritual functions to help with order. So it's very interesting that God already assisted us with... Okay. So we have like this. We have prayer. We have instituted prayers three times a day. And what that is a set time, a set place, a set prayer. Right? So even if you have a, com a complicated morning... You can reset it with the afternoon prayer. You have a complicated afternoon, you can reset it with an evening prayer. Right? It's a time and structure. Not only that, our sages tell us that a person should pray in the same place because God awaits you in your place. He awaits your prayer. So whether you pray at home, whether you pray at synagogue, you should have your, it's called a makom kavua, a set place for your prayer. Because God loves your prayer so much, he comes and he waits for you in your place. And if you're praying in the other side, it's like, one second, I, I thought you were here. You go, right? It, obviously, God loves our prayer wherever it is, right? Wherever it is. But there's something special and unique to having a set order to our prayers. And one of the steady things that our sages tell us is that a person should have a set time for study every day. Even if it's just five minutes, ten minutes, one minute, a person should have a set time. Kviat itim Torah. It says a person should always have a set time for learning. Even if it's, again, if you have between 9 o'clock and 9.05, you have a study partner, you'll talk over the phone, and you'll just learn one idea. Perfect. Have a set time. That's also a way in which our sages teach us to have this structure. There's almost no situation that can be controlled without order. Right? If effort, right, it means every challenge that we have, if we organize, if we order our day, and particularly when we have that mission statement written out. So now we say, okay, what are my priorities based on my mission statement? Right? I'm going to have this change in my schedule. I'm going to have this change. How can I reorder myself and put myself right back on, on track? The, uh, there are extreme situations, obviously, but every day can surely identify. We can surely identify situations that are irregular and out of the ordinary that can result in unnecessary anger, fear, worry, stress, because there are all of these challenges that come up. Right? If we have those priorities in order, we can we can realign ourselves. We see that Joseph. Joseph, I always like to say about Joseph, he gave a recommendation to Pharaoh. That they should have, they're going to have seven years of, of plenty and seven years of re of reserves after because there's going to be a famine. He he put together the first savings account, right? The first savings account, and he says, "Listen, we're going to have seven years of plenty." And this was his dream, right? The, the the Pharaoh's dream with the seven cows that were strong and the seven cows that were weak and the seven, et cetera, et cetera. He was organized. That order put him in charge of Potiphar's house. That order got him out of jail. Put him in Pharaoh's. Uh, kingdom put him second in command from 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 some our pesach seder we said again is order the mishnah is structured in order a person needs to set a time and we we've discussed this in other classes we've talked about this to have a set time that all of us here can have something which unites us all in order can anybody think of something that can unite us all every week with order Shabbos candles, right? Shabbos candle lighting time is a set time where it's not different for any person around the world, right? It's 18 minutes before sunset every single Friday evening. 
So what would re be required, this just to give you an example, what would be required to have that order? Sunset. That, that's not going to change. But you know what could change? If I don't have my candles set up. If when time comes, I don't have my matches there. If, you know, if I'm not in the right place, right? You understand there are circumstances that can come up. So what do you need to do? You need to prepare. I already prepared, right? One of the things I like to do is to prepare the Shabbos candles for next Shabbos, the, the right after Shabbos. So last night already, I prepared next Shabbos' candles, right? I prepared for my wife. It's all set, ready to go, ready from yesterday evening. After Shabbos, it's already set, okay? The idea that I, I don't want to be in a situation where it's like last minute, hey, hey, we got to set the candles, it hasn't, right? So I know that it, it's it's all it's all it's all there and it's all structured. Oh yeah, got gotcha you covered. You know, my grandfather um, was a a great man. He actually, I have over here translated a couple of chapters from his book on order. And it really, it's 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 remarkable how he worked on this trait of order so diligently. To always have a structure, my, my father would tell me that when he would wake up in the morning as a little child, now they had a very, very small apartment, and he would sleep in what was the dining room, the living room, the uh, study, and my grandfather was writing a book, this book, right? He was writing um, wh while my father was a little, a little child. My, my father said he would wake up to a barrage of typing on the, on the typewriter, and then there would be silence total silence and then a few minutes later another barrage of typing on the typewriter and my grandfather would process everything in his mind organize it and then type it out so later on in, in the 80s you know when word process processors became more popular my father said to my grandfather why don't I get you a, a word processor so you, you know so you, you can you don't have to use a, an ancient typewriter she says, what would I use that for? This is like this. You can move paragraphs up and down, and you can change things. He says, I've, I've never needed to change a single. He never needed to change a single thing he wrote. Right? It, uh, it's absolutely remarkable. Never needed to change it. I'll tell you why. Order. He had order in his mind. And he, had, he structured order in every area of his life. Okay, so that he he thinks things through. You know, I would come to my grandfather. Many people think that um, you ask a question to someone today on, on, on Facebook or on WhatsApp or on a text and that you need to spit out an answer like a vending machine. You put in two quarters, boom, you pop out your soda, right? And that's the way, like, you ask a rabbi a question and boom, he's supposed to, you know, pop out an answer. So I tell my students, I teach in the girls' school, the girls' high school, and sometimes the students will ask me a question, and I, I don't respond. I'll respond two hours later, three hours later, a day later, two days later. They're like, are you ignoring my message? I'm like, no, I'm thinking about your question. And I will give you, hopefully, a well-baked answer. So I remember I asked my grandfather a question, and I was like, no, <laughs> what's the answer? He says, come back to me in a week or two, and I'll have an answer for you. And I came back a week or two later, and he gave me an answer that was so crystal clear that was so thought through. All of the, and sometimes it could be big, important life questions. You want a rabbi to just spit out an answer? Or you want someone to th process it, to think it through, to see through the, the challenges that would be on all sides. The problem is we're in a world of instant, mm -hmm. where everything is like, you know, okay, I'm not going to trigger my phone, but turn on the lights, turn off the lights. Everything has to be instant, right? You go, to, you go to Starbucks, you have to wait for more than a minute. I can't believe it. The service here is terrible. Right? Like it's like, right? why, why, why do I have to wait for my coffee? Everything is instant. Right? Think things through. We have to f be deliberate in what we do. Be thorough in what we do. And by the way, it, it, it's, it, it's by the way, in, in business, it's no different. In business, it's no different. Try to rush a decision. You should you make this acquisition or not? Come on, come on, quick, 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 quick. You, make, you might make a terrible mistake by rushing. Right? Think it through. Work through the numbers. See that everything adds up. 
You know, one of the great rabbis, the altar of Slobodka, the great the sage of Slobodka, he once went to the, wanted to go visit his son in yeshiva. So he said, he came to the yeshiva, and they were like, wow, the altar came, the, you know, the sage came to, to visit his son. They, they said, he says, they came to the yeshiva, they said, Here, here's, here's, the d- here's the study hall. He says, no, 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 I didn't come to see the study hall. I want to see his room. <laughs> he went to his room. He opened up. He saw his closet was organized. He says, now I know how my son is doing. I can go. It, n- it, well, one, it, they bring it. They bring the story in in various different places, but but you want to see the or- how someone is doing order in their life. I have a a very close uh, friend, a study partner I learned with. He just sold his company, and I remember the first time we had a real exchange. So we were learning for a while. I was very young then. I was uh, 28 years old, and. Uh, I remember he, he commented to me, and he says, he says, look at you. You come here without a tie, right? You come here like a, you know, like a, like, like a schlamazel, right? <laughs> look at you, right? Look at you. He says, put yourself together, right? And it was, it was a very important, and again, we, we, were, we were friends. We were close friends, but it was, it was a very important perspective that I didn't have. And he was basically saying, you're my rabbi. Right? As my rabbi, I want to look up to you. I want to see you in a way that's appropriate. It's a very interesting thing. We're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about kavod, which means honor and dignity. That many people don't understand. You ever see, I'm just uh, giving give an example because I know that you'll, you'll be able to understand this. Right? We'll all be able to understand this. You ever see a priest? Right? They have this white collar. Right? They're walking in a very proper way. Imagine you see a priest si- standing at the street corner with his leg up on the back, you know, leaning back against the wall, reading a paper, smoking a cigarette, right? Would you say that's a little bit of an odd image? Right? Why? It's, uh, it, it's the wrong. It, 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 it doesn't hold the dignity that we assume someone like that should hold. And why would it be any different for a rabbi? Why is it okay for a rabbi Potentially, I'm not saying that there is, but for a rabbi to be walking around in shorts and flip-flops in front of his congregants, <laughs> right? It, would it be odd? It would be a little odd, right? It, there's something that's missing there in the dignity of... of, of and, and this is what, what, what my, my dear friend brought to my attention. You have to present yourself in a way that carries... That doesn't mean you have to be all, uh, you know... Uh, higher, uh, you know, higher than thou, and and to and to present yourself in a way that that holier than thou, or in a way that's that's no. You have to be, you have to be a mensch. You have to be a human being. You have to, but there's a proper way to carry yourself, right? Th- this we're living in a culture today that even that is very very minimized. Where today, you know, the CEO can come into a company into into his own office, you know, wearing a T-shirt and jeans. It used to not be like that. You came in. Right? People used to fly, right? When people would fly, right? They'd, when people would fly, they'd get dressed up and they'd get, you know. Today, people are just like, you know. If they showered within a week, we'd say, okay. You know, it's like, we're lucky. It, it really is a crazy world where there isn't the proper dignity. But again, it's because of a lack of order. It's because of a lack of recognition to what is the appropriate way to carry myself. What is the appropriate way for me to handle my own dignity? Right, and it really is. We need to open ourselves up to understanding that you know, when someone carries the, you know, when when their car is a mess, you can imagine what else in their life is a mess, right? Right? When when they have structure in 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 one in, you start with one area, right? Start with one area. Your desk. Very important for your desk to be organized, <laughs> right? Because your desk will I- w- is is representative of other areas of your life. It doesn't mean that if someone has everything folded neatly that that means order in their life, right? But it is an indication of something. It's an indication of something. The, our sages tell us that order I, attests to will. When someone has a will, power, they want to accomplish something, they figure out an order of how to get there. The order that we have in this world attests to the will of the Almighty. The Almighty's will is that there should be structure. 
that there should be, you know, there's, again, like we said, a sunrise and a sunset. There is the galaxies that are exact in every millisecond of their, uh, their, their uh, you know, th the way they, 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 they circle around, they orbit around the Earth, the way, th the way they, they are properly placed, each in their right place. It is so important for us to understand that our own world, our own personal lives, we have our own orbit. Things need to be in their proper place, in their proper time. The people, th things need to have their appropriate focus. Order is also the key to any spiritual growth. A person can't grow spiritually in chaos. It's impossible. We have to have order in our day, right? Order in our life. What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to accomplish? We have to answer that. Where do I want to go? What can I already accomplish from the skills, the abilities that I already possess? Right? It's always the question that's asked. So let's say someone says, I want to be more charitable. Right? In what way can I already do that right now? Well, you know what? I have some free time. Maybe I can call up the Jewish Family Service and volunteer my time. Maybe I can donate some time to the, to the uh, Seven Acres. Maybe I can donate my time to the, to, the, to the Federation. Maybe I can do something with the time that I already have. But if a person doesn't identify what they want to accomplish, right, they're certainly not going to get to when they can accomplish that or how they can accomplish it. Right? It's very important for a person to always have a knowledge of what you want to accomplish, where you want to go, and what can I already do with what I have. Yes, absolutely. A person needs to. If a person has a desire to do something, it's likely that's part of their trunot, part of their traits that they need to, they, they need to accomplish. By the way, there's something called kedusha, right? There's kedusha of order. Right? Right? It's very important. When we say kadosh, 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 you know what that's called? It's called the holiness of order. Right? Very structured. Um, okay. So, my friends, I hope we have some, some uh, thought for this, uh, for this week uh, going forward and uh, to be inspired to uh, hopefully change and grow this coming week in a whole new way. And uh, I look forward to seeing all y'all next week. Have a, have a terrific week. Have an order, orderly week.